Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and I am here today on my show, Author to Author, with Thane Bielan, who has written a book, Help Me, Lord, I Need You. How are you tonight? I'm doing terrific. That's great. That's great. I'm over to this. Yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you. So this should be an interesting interview. Um, before we um, actually begin the interview, would you like to open us with prayer? I would. Okay. Mm -hmm. God in heaven, we thank you so much for the many blessings you grant us in our lives, especially in this Easter season. We thank you for the gifts shared with us, like those that are shared with us because of the dedicated work of Cynthia and the WCA team. We pray that all we do and share in this time together gives glory to you and is a blessing for those who are listening. Let us never forget that you are a loving and merciful God and that you love us and call us to an eternal, joy-filled relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, uh, thank you for opening us. Um, so, um, I'm kind of curious as to what led you to write this book. Well, um, it was an inspiration for sure. Um, I've been many years in different uh, ministries, and uh, one of the one of the more interesting ones was uh, when I was a, an eighth grade uh, catechist. I did that for about 13 years. And I interacted with a lot of different people, different backgrounds. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, through through time, you just hear a lot of stories. And and um, I'm always, uh, I love I love to hear people's stories. I love to ask questions about, you know, their progression through their situations. And uh, uh, very honestly, I, I felt this, this push a little better than a decade ago to to write a book and i thought yeah i i, I like writing i i could write a book but i have no clue what i would write about and then uh, a few years later um it, I, I think the lord was kind of feeding me to start writing down some of the stories that i had you know heard from people and um before long uh i could kind of see a, a direction with these stories they're very diverse um, all the stories in the book are, are true stories of people's experiences and problems and, and solutions. And um, so as I, I started writing these down more, I started to have a sense of th this, this is what the Lord wants me to do with these stories. He wants a book. But I very honestly, through the process, I, you know, I, I, I really never could put a clear picture of what this thing was going to look like, but it, it started to evolve, and the more it evolved, the more I could hear him pointing certain directions, and before long, I came together. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I have, it's kind of funny, because I, I have read my book many times, as you can only imagine, and there are different times I've read some of these stories, or some of the, some of the parts of the stories, and I'm thinking, did I write that? You know, it's just kind of, it's almost an awakening to me or him speaking to me about what people learned at a point when I needed to hear that as well, mm -hmm. <laughs> how it all came together. And the, um, we, as I was, I had uh, five different people uh, edit the book and, we, um, and uh, all gave beautiful insights about direction and things I could do different with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had that experience too, where the, the people that read it to see what you have someone read them to see what they think, and yeah. they can come up with things. And it's like, I look at my book and it's like, why didn't I see that? Yeah. <laughs> really? Absolutely. I mean, it was glaring. Why did I not see that? <laughs> but yeah, so it's, I understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. So, um, can or do you feel free to tell some of the stories? Oh, sure. 
I uh, very honestly, I I started the very first story with uh, uh, a story of, of an experience my wife and I had uh, early in our marriage. Um, we uh, had a young daughter, and at the uh, age she was a little over two years old, she came up with a, a very uh, rare uh, blood disease, <clears throat> and uh, she uh, we went through uh, about six weeks of just unbelievable uh, chaos and blur and pain in our life. And uh, I uh, remembered uh, my story actually is about I would uh, sit in the chapel at the hospital praying for her. And um, I, at one point, you know, I prayed like crazy for uh, healing for her. And um, I finished my prayer with, uh, but your will be done, Lord. And uh, I'll leave the rest of the story for the readers. But um, basically, it was, uh, you know, a major, major issue for us at that time that uh, we struggled through. And um, uh, the Lord helped us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. There's uh, probably some of the stories I get a lot of feedback on. Um, is uh, there's another story of a friend who had a real challenge with a situation that occurred in his life, and he was very angry at another person. And uh, he just, uh, he was a good Christian man, but he was so angry, and he just could not forgive the other person. And um, it, his story is about how did he learn to do that and what was the process of forgiveness uh, for him. And um, we get, I get feedback on that story quite often because probably everybody struggles with forgiveness of some kind. Mm -hmm. Things that yeah. have happened to them, people that, you know, have offended them in, in just a serious way. And, um, and so, you know, a lot of people commented about how they learn some things that help them. Um, and uh, that, that's a popular story. And then there's another story of uh, my wife in the same situation with a child, um, how she was angry with God. And um, friend came along that uh, surprisingly surprised her. Um, and helping her uh, deal with her anger with God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, she learned to overcome that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that has to be a difficult one, getting yeah. um, forgiving God. I mean, it's <clears throat> I've heard of people having to do that before, before because they're so upset with something, yes. you know. Yeah, it's got to be very hard. Very I think, difficult. Uh, I think there's probably more people in the world today challenged with that very thing. You know, people, mm -hmm. I, I personally believe that many atheists are really people who are simply mad at God about something. Mm -hmm. and they really, it's their challenge is to learn how to overcome that and to better, have a better understanding and a deeper faith. Mm -hmm. So I think that story resonates for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can see where it would, especially um, in a culture like ours where just about everything can go, you know, everything's, you, no matter what you want to define yourself as, what you want to do, how you want to live, um, that, you know, I can see where people would, uh, would struggle if they're at all out of the mean, you know, the mathematical mean. And could get angry at God, and I mean that's that would be a real issue. Yeah, and trying to get over angry, being angry at God. Yeah, you know. So, and simple enough. I have a sister who, um, um, she's since passed, but she was she was angry with God for a long time, and her issue really was how could God let these things happen? Mm -hmm. And you know, it wasn't until nearly the end of her life that she began to reach out to God again and to grasp an understanding and not, you know, be 
angry with him any longer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Boy, that would be scary, too. I mean, to wake up one day and realize you're angry at God. I mean, there's, there's a real power differential there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just, um, and we know that God is perfectly good. So for us to be angry at him, it's to say that he's done something to irritate us or wronged us somehow. It's it's bizarre. Yeah. But I, yeah. But people don't always think of those things when they're, you know, when you're angry, you're angry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you tend to be very emotional about something. <laughs> you take, take great offense to something and uh, mm -hmm. it kind of shuts down your uh, logic. I think, in yeah. A lot of ways. It's like mm -hmm. the, the forgiveness issue is, you know, I think what uh, people, when they can't forgive, what they don't always understand is they're the ones carrying the burden. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the person they're angry with doesn't even know, you know, yeah. that mm -hmm. they've offended or that the person's angry yeah. or understands what the issue is. The person mm -hmm. who's unforgiving is the person carrying the burden. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a handy little trick of the demons. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Deception. Yeah. yeah. I remember at one point I was really angry at someone at work. Uh, this was before I was a theologian. I was really, it was actually, it was before I was Catholic. <laughs> and I was really angry with this person at work. And finally, I said something. It's like, you know, I can't believe what you did to me. And there was this expression of like, what? On their face, like, what did I do? <laughs> and, uh, did I do anything? <laughs> no. If I did, it certainly wasn't aimed at you. <laughs> No. And it's like, so you're really right when you say that the people that have done the offending probably don't even know that whatever they said or did or the facial expression uh, insulted someone. It's, uh, it's a handy trick for the demons. <laughs> it works pretty good, too. <laughs> oh, they talk about uh, how you, uh, you're, you're in a hurry to get to work and somebody cuts you off and you think, Boy, why that, he, that guy did that on purpose. And, you know, it's very circumstantial, has nothing to do with personal offense. And But you go to work angry because somebody cut you off on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> They've been sitting alongside the road waiting for you to come so they could cut in front of you. I know it. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's... It's... Sometimes for intelligent, rational people, we're neither intelligent nor rational. <laughs> yes, that's yes, so uh, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of funny. But, I will hmm. admit, uh, for myself, I too used to <clears throat> have a great deal of trouble forgiving, and and somebody mm -hmm. had offended somebody close uh, in relationship had. Uh, offended me terribly uh, during our trial with our daughter. And mm -hmm. uh, I carried that for a long, long time. And I, I heard uh, a pastor in uh, a homily one Sunday uh, talking about, you know, Peter is asking Jesus about how many times should he uh, forgive his enemy? Seven times. And you know, I had heard this gospel so many times. Jesus talking about no, 77 times. But that particular day, it hit me like a boy. Mm -hmm. I need to forgive that person every time I think of them, every time I see them, every time I hear their name. That's the first thing that should go through my mind is I forgive that person. And every time I did that, you never forget what they did, but yeah. you lessen the load every single time. And now, all at once, I found myself praying for them in their sickness near death. And <laughs> if they even knew I was mad at they probably never do. Uh, but uh, they would probably have been even more shocked to think that I'd even be praying for them when I went mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um 
I just a few years ago uh, published my memoir with Sebastian, and um, my memoir is uh, titled uh, Survivor, a Memoir of Forgiveness. Um, and it's the story of um, of one uh, 1949, uh, I was conceived, and my mother tried to chemically abort me. And when she started, of course, she started to bleed. She was losing me. And she was afraid she might die, too, so she stopped. And she told me when I was 11. And I would say... It was a good 40 years that I actually hated that woman. I could see nothing good in her. Um, she was uh, not overly bright. I'm not saying that in a mean way. She just wasn't. Um, she grew up in a time when, you know, if you went through the fifth or sixth grade, that was good enough, you know. And, um, you know, it, it really, um, it took an awful lot of work to get to neutral and think about that it's like it was so bad like five years later i finally got to the point where I, I could think of her and not get angry i was neutral so forgiveness is no easy thing especially especially when the wrong is not imagined you know so when she told me she tried to abort me that was bad enough, but then I said, well, why did you stop taking this chemical or medicine? And she said, because I was afraid I'd die too. And I thought, the only reason that I'm alive is because you were afraid of dying. And, but you weren't hesitating to kill me. <laughs> you know, and it, that, that even as I was only 11 when she told me that, and it was like, I couldn't believe anyone. I mean, I actually walked away thinking, she's really stupid and i mean really I mean, how could you say something like that and be serious mm -hmm. i didn't want to die so i thought i'd let you <laughs> I'll let you live because i didn't want to die wow thank you so much <laughs> the holy spirit had a hand in that situation because look what you've become today you know so <laughs> your mother didn't have she never had a chance <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um but yeah, so it's like that, that really was uh, like a number one um, problem with my life until maybe the last few years, um, because it really bothered me the sense that, um, you know, I mean, there's not really anything you can do to make a reparation for something like that. And I kept thinking, you know, I, I've done genealogy, and you see all these people up on the top that were married, and then there's like 20 kids or 15 kids. And I thought to myself, if you go up on that, that chart and you just take out one of those married people, you can lose 1,000 people, 2,000 people over a couple of centuries, people that would have been born but never will be. And uh, that was what really struck me. It didn't just affect me. It affected a whole line of descent that would have come from me. And uh, anyway, but yeah, I learned, I think God wanted me to wait until I was in my 60s to work on that one. Um, <laughs> and, um, but I did learn, what I learned was how difficult it is to really forgive somebody, you know, because it's like, you know, every once in a while I have a thought and it's like I have to step on it because I know that where it will lead, it will lead to more remembering something else I should forgive her for. <laughs> but anyway, so it's, uh, it's, a very, it's a very fascinating topic. Well, I think you just said something really key is that when the thought arises in your mind, you have to step on it and stop yeah. it. Yes. And I think that goes with every temptation in the world mm -hmm. you know anything and everything that the devil tempts us with mm -hmm. we have to say stop right there yeah and and turn away and i mean just that one step on it approach can change your life in such an incredibly positive way you know mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. need to hear what you just said yeah well yeah, I mean, I think finally, now I'm 74, 
and uh, last summer, and I thought of doing this, and this summer I'm going to do it. Uh, I live about 250 miles, maybe 300 from where they're buried. But um, I thought I would actually go to their graves, which is gigantic. Now, I was there once only to make sure everything had been done properly. And I was there another time with a relative who wanted to visit his deceased wife, a very old man. And I did see their gravestone. But, um, you know, it's like, I, I was 11, I'm 74, 63 years. I've carried this ridiculous burden, <laughs> you know? And it's like, so much of it is my own fault. And that's, that's the thing people, they, it, something will fester in you if you think about it. Fester, 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 gets worse, gets worse, gets worse. And, um, but I finally got to the point where this summer, unless something health-wise or car-wise happens, I intend on going down to their graves. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's funny, uh, I have uh, another story in the book about a, an elderly lady. In fact, um, I think she is 90 mm -hmm. now. And wow. uh, she, we were in a... Um, a small group session one time and she felt compelled to tell the story about when she was uh, just out of high school she and a good friend were supposed to go off someplace her friend had asked her to join her in some event and um, she said sure she would go well before the event came along just before the event came along somebody else invited her to something that she had much rather go to. And so she told the first friend, I can't go. And she went to the second. And she felt guilty forever. And even though a short time later, her friend was not real happy with her missing the event, uh, but a short time later, she confessed what she had done. And her friend said, okay, I forgive you. But even to this day, he was confessing how she still could not forgive herself for them. And I think sometimes forgiveness is a problem, even to the point where we can't forgive ourselves. Oh, yeah. And sometimes that's even the deeper root, is we can't forgive ourselves of something. But people need to know God is a loving, merciful, mm -hmm. and forgiving God. And mm -hmm. uh, I heard somebody, I think it was a priest, Donald Fairman, who said, you know, um, when you go to reconciliation and you confess your sins, God forgives you. But if you keep revisiting it, God's going to say to you, look at, I've already forgot about that. You asked for reconciliation. I gave it to you. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so we had a really nice uh, conversation with this lady. She's just a sweet, sweet lady. And, uh, I think she, hopefully, as she walked away, uh, you know, thinking that very same thing. God mm -hmm. loves us and forgives us. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and oh my gosh, look at Jesus. Oh, yeah. Uh, reconciliation. Um, <clears throat> Yowzer. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. We're lucky uh, in Christianity and, of course, more specifically in, in, uh, Catholicism to be aware of that true nature of God you know it's um, it's something that we should he forgives everything if we ask yes we can't forgive ourselves we can't forgive our neighbor you know and it's like what we need to be doing is looking at the example because anything that we do is an infinite insult you know, to God, if we if we sin, which of course we all do, but um, it's uh, it's just very interesting when you when you start to think about something that was done, yeah, sixty sixty three years ago, and that is still bothers me. And I mean, I'm sure that there are many others who are in the same boat, and uh, it's it's an issue that uh, 
you know, people need to be, I've tried to turn my awareness of it and uh, the pain that it caused me so that I'm really like rapidly anti-life, uh, anti-pro-life, anti-abortion. I said that wrong, but um, yeah, so I'm like rapidly anti-abortion. And, you know, when they came out, when they started to coming out with the chemical abortions, I thought, I mean, man, this just gets worse and worse, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so just, um, we, uh, the last few years that we uh, taught eighth grade, um, as I just said, we mm -hmm. taught um, about the theology of the body. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was interesting the conversation we could have with those kids at that age. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're lively in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I love to watch the kids when we would talk about some of these things. It, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a matter of talking about sexuality. Mm -hmm. It was uh, talking about God's purpose, God loving us and how we are made in his image and likeness to love unconditionally. And, um, and to respect and treat each other with dignity. Yeah. And I think that that's a message that's missing in our culture today because, you know, uh, <laughs> the abortion topic, uh, a mm -hmm. child is expendable. Well, a child is one of the most valuable creations of God, <laughs> you know, and if we understood that, um, mm -hmm. abortion would be a non topic, is what mm -hmm. I believe anyway. Mm -hmm. And the theology of the body, you know, anybody listening, if they uh, did, did did some study, you know, Pope John Paul II is the one who introduced the teaching of that in, in the way that we do it today. And uh, it is so beautiful. He, he had such incredible wisdom and understanding and understood the importance of teaching that to the, to all of us. So, um I think, you know, that that's such an important uh, topic. Um, mm -hmm. Although I don't talk about abortion uh, in my book, I touch on a lot of other things that, you know, um, my focus is to try and help people gain a deeper understanding of God's love for them and how to develop that relationship with God mm -hmm. through, through prayer, through the sacraments, you know, through the virtues, you know, try to communicate that uh, through the book to help people have a deeper understanding and develop a deeper relationship with God. And truly, that's the purpose of, of the book. Um, I think when it's all, that, that's what I learned as God uh, dragged me along in the process. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thing to learn. <laughs> yes, it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I mentioned we had um, uh, five people uh, review and edit the book for me. Two of them were priests. Um, one priest in particular, uh, I got probably a whole lot more than I expected, uh, but his thoughts and, uh, and, and corrections in some areas uh, were extremely uh, helpful to me. And uh, just uh, a short while, just be, as I was, Working on the publishing of the book, uh, we have a son, and he um, committed suicide. Oh. And um, so my priest friend said, um, it appears to me you have another chapter to add to the book. And uh, I thought and prayed about it a long time, and I thought, no, that's a book in itself. Yeah. And it's actually turning into two books. Um, we're really, folks, my wife is working with me now on the second and the third book. The second book um, is a book that, at the moment, uh, the title I have for it is Why Am I Here? And our direction with that book is uh, towards helping people understand who are they really, and what do they bring into this world, what is their purpose. It's not to tell them what the purpose is, it's to challenge them to learn and understand what that is. What, what is God's purpose of them being here? And, and, you know, I, I feel like our audience for that book is people who are struggling in life, maybe even suicidal, um, people who are dealing with depression, things of that nature, is to help them 
gain a deeper understanding of why are they here. And then the third book is targeted towards people who have lost someone uh, in their life through suicide. And mm -hmm. uh, that book will be stories also of other people, parents, brothers, sisters, <laughs> and some relation of some sort and how uh, how how do they deal with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Well, that's you know that's like a series that could help people. <laughs> no, I hope so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah the, the 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 issue of suicide is uh, so big in our culture today, and I believe it's you know I heard uh, a friend. Um, I say a friend. I read his book, which helped us uh, through that journey. Uh, it's Father Chris Alar, and he wrote a book after suicide. And uh, somewhere in there, he talked about it's interesting how the number of suicides are up and the number of people going to church is down. Do you think there's a relationship? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, Chris Alar, that name sounds familiar. I, did, do you know if he went to Holy Apostles College and Seminary? He, uh, he was the president, uh, he's, he was the president of the, um, priest of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in, um, uh, Massachusetts. And, um, he, he, you can see him on YouTube. He's on there a lot. He, he really is, um, uh, very candid about a lot of topics and extremely mm -hmm. faithful. Mm-hmm. The name rings a bell with me. Um, I don't know. Maybe he was studying at Pontifex or at Holy Apostles at one point. Where did you say that was at? Uh, I I taught at Holy Apostles for the college and seminary for thirty years, and then I went on to Pontifex University, which is a online uh, masters uh, in theology and doctorate in theology. Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh -huh. names. Very familiar. Yeah, hmm. I met him a uh, uh, year or so, uh, or so ago, and uh, he's. I, I really, uh, I really appreciate him a great deal. He, he had <clears> lost <throat> a grandmother to suicide, and uh, it was a number of years later that he could actually um, begin to deal with it and write about it. So mm -hmm. uh, he's just. A, I, I like him a lot. He's very inspirational to me. Anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look him up and see if he's familiar looking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Check out YouTube. You'll definitely see him on there. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. So, yeah, so there's certainly a lot of social problems where, you know, in this country especially, I think, um, where people hurt themselves, hurt others, don't have many values anymore mm -hmm. i think that that's the kind of thing that's causing these problems people yeah. don't hope it's just i think that's the big issue they can't cope with you know they don't know how to cope they don't think perhaps they don't the first thing that comes through their mind may not be to pray that may be the last and it should be in the exact reverse order no, absolutely right. I'm, uh, we're, we're leading a Bible study right now uh, by um, Edward III. It's called When You Pray. And um, the, it's, it is not about how to pray. It's about developing a deeper sense of prayer. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, is, it is so very good um, because there's, there's a great focus in violence and mm -hmm. the best conversationalist is the person who dominates the listening mm -hmm. and so uh, everyone should probably consider god as a great conversationalist because all he gets to do most of the time is listen <laughs> and we do all the talking um, mm -hmm. however um there, there's a if you think about the spirit um, most people, if they think about the spirit, they don't think about the spirit talking necessarily. But God wants to talk to us, and He only gets a chance if we just 
be quiet for a while and listen because God will talk to us. And there's so much noise and chaos in our world. Mm -hmm. People con contribute to the chaos with their emotional you know, responses to anything and everything. Um, the greatest response most often is the response of respect being quiet, you know, and not being condemning. And uh, mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we take time in deep prayer and quiet ourselves and listen, and I think a lot of time, you know, for me at one point in my life, I didn't listen very long because I didn't think I was hearing anything. So if God's not talking to me, I must need to keep talking, you know. And I think, you know, the real issue is we're not listening long enough. We want him to respond on our time. He's going to respond in his time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a really extremely important thing is to be able to silence yourself. Get Just get away from everything. Find your quiet space. It could be go to a church when nobody's there. It could be in your room. It could be in the garden. You know, it's different. Uh, quite honestly, for me, I, I, uh, my living room is a good place because um, it's just my wife and I, and she does things in one area, and and I have a, a playlist of uh, instrumental music that's very calming, and mm -hmm. it's become a space for me where I can put my headset on, blot out every other noise around me, listen to the music, and just step back. And before long, uh, God is talking to me. Well, I just open myself up and say, Lord, I'm wide open to you. I know you are here. I'm listening. <laughs> and the music calms me. Sometimes it plays through a few songs before anything I'm, you know, uh, hearing or receiving begins to come to me. But um, for everybody, it's different. It's not necessarily that, but for others, it could be as well. But it, I think the important thing is to find the space where we can be quiet and listen to God and engage deeply with Him. Not superficially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Not that that much matters, but... <laughs> but uh, but I, agree. I agree with you. <laughs> so. well, I remember the day when news was news on TV. Now, today, now, these days, uh, news is... Uh, to be entertainment and to be dramatic and to be, you know, all kinds of things. And uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't even give people an opportunity to process with just continual noise and chaos coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That, I think, is one of the uh, devil's biggest uh, triumphs in this time, is to keep us busy and... Um, overworked and overthinking and just being bombarded with media it's like you know it's like our brains are so full of reacting with these things that we don't really have much quiet time and if we do we don't know what to do with it <laughs> you know get out your device and bury yourself in a game or something you know yeah yeah exactly yeah uh, yeah, it's a sad thing. You had to play ball or, or something outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I think uh, when people think of, of what's wrong in most modern countries like this, you know, I think they're thinking of things like crime or social class, poverty, racism, sexism. But those aren't really the big issues. Those issues are because we've lost touch with God and don't know how to get to it again. Yes, so. I agree. I think um, we, we, my wife and I, when our children were younger, we were the first to admit nobody had ever trained us to be parents. Mm -hmm. The only training we ever had was watching our parents. And, you know, I, I got to believe probably most anybody who, especially if they're in their teens, you know, coming out of their teams, have figured out all the things my dad did wrong 
and they're never going to do them. Mm -hmm. they do. And so uh, our children were probably, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, something like that. And um, we took a parenting class. And this parenting class was with about a dozen other parents, couples. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really great. We gained a lot of insights. Uh, talking with each other it was always comical because we had similar funny things going on. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, a while ago was thinking, I think parents today have a far bigger challenge than we did when we were parents. But what do they do about learning to be a parent? And um, mm -hmm. so I started doing some exploring for parenting programs. And I found a program and um, I liked it a lot because um, the, the person teaching the program was a father of 10 children. Mm -hmm. And I figured if there's chaos in any household, it's got to be his. Um, what I greatly appreciated about this person was he was a, a very a uh, faith-filled Catholic woman who um, teaches about building your own family Catholic coaching. And in doing so, you begin to, um, I'll say, I hate to use the word control, but in a way, better control um, the allowance of some of the chaos of the world into your family. Because in teaching um, those Catholic values and living those Catholic values, you uh, better equip your children as they grow up. And um, in time and times I've heard people say, when you do that sort of thing, well, you don't really prepare your children for the world. They go into the world so naive. In my opinion, they might be naive to the chaos of the culture, but they're better found grounded in the faith and their relationship with God, which is far more important than, you know, knowing about all the silly stuff that goes on out there. <clears throat> and so I feel it's really important, you know, for parents to get that kind of education to <laughs> support and to work with each other, other Catholic parents <laughs> and trying to raise their children in, in their faith and in, in, a, in their life. Um, yeah. I firmly believe in Catholic schools because they will learn the same kinds of things they learn in a public school, except that environment tends to be a, 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 an environment with greater respect. And I have always told my children, there's two things, two skills I'd rather you move out in the world with. One is people skills and the other communication skills. People mm -hmm. skills is being respectful and understanding how to communicate with people and treat them mm -hmm. And you can learn any other skill out there going to school or, or through some sort of training, but those two skills built on a foundation of faith make a much stronger person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, we talk a lot about uh, Catholic values at, at uh, my parish here in Springfield, Vermont. The priest is excellent. And uh, we talk about Catholic values and how they should be brought into the family. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so I think that there is an awareness of that. You can't really raise your kids as if you're a secular family. You know, it, it just doesn't work. You've got to bring the religion in and the culture in. And, uh, you know, they're certainly working on trying to help people do that. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, there is a um, my wife and I have been involved in marriage prep for her. Mm -hmm. was in, uh, we, we always used a program called Focus, which was about more about facilitating conversation with the engaged couple on topics maybe they hadn't considered or even talked about. But in the last number of years, a new program came out called Witness to Love. Witness to Love does exactly what you were just talking about. Its focus is on helping this engaged couple understand the virtues that are important in their married life 
And mm -hmm. the process helps them work through that to first identify them, identify where they're strong or weak, and set goals for how would they improve on those things. It's a beautiful program <clears throat> that I think has uh, demonstrated tremendous success in mm -hmm. um, maintaining solid uh, married, marriage relationships. Uh, and they're, I mean, they have a, almost a nil divorce rate in something like 12 years, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. It is. But you're right. Those, you know, focusing on those virtues and continually teaching those things is very important. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't think there's enough emphasis on that now. No, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in general. Um, so, I don't it's know. A, it's, a, it's another issue that we can let, add to the list. We're doing very good, though. We're finding problems and we're finding solutions in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Soon the world will be fine if they listen to us. <laughs> uh, I consider myself a sponge. I'm still trying to learn and grow, you know. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I made yeah. a lot of observations, thankfully, but uh, I, I know I have a long ways to go yet. <laughs> we all do. We all. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, you know, I think we've. I think we've covered most of the problems of the country <laughs> and the family and in less than an hour. That's so bad. <laughs> now, if only some people would listen to us. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, it's all very interesting. I mean, we know in the end that, uh, that, you know, God wins, but, um, not that it's a contest, but uh, or it's really more of a battle. But we know in the end he wins. All we have to do, really, all we have to do is start listening to him and trying to work with him. Yes. And that's what's missing, you know. Yes. So that, you know, that if we can just get a little, uh, you know, kind of snappy saying for that, you know, that's like five words long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mission statement short one yeah yeah short mission statement that gives you the idea and is snappy enough that people will be like singing it wasn't they work or something <laughs> yeah they're easier to remember when you can play music to it that's right that's right so uh yeah it is you know i don't think that the i don't think that finding solutions to these problems are as difficult as we make them, you know, because I think that the one issue is to start changing the way we live and start changing the culture. And then I think things will almost, not maybe automatically, but they'll start leaning in the right direction. Yes, I, I find that I cannot, um, I somewhat resist to particularly uh, a lot of the political conversations because they tend to get pretty emotional. Oh, and, yeah. And I, I feel like I don't I don't believe there's any one politician out there who can fix our problem. But no. I know somebody who can. And I believe he has a lot of people out in our culture working, mm -hmm. you know, to help people grow. Only God can really make the difference in my mind. But he has so many uh, people in ministry out there mm -hmm. that are working hard to help people find God and mm -hmm. lean on God for the solutions. And mm -hmm. so I, I have to, uh, I believe me, I have to catch myself. It's too easy to start to get into one of those conversations. And about halfway in there, you go, oh, shut my mouth. <laughs> you know? Because uh, it's not getting anybody anywhere. But mm -hmm. stop myself, just like you said earlier. I got to stop it, and then I got to start praying. And, yeah. Um, and telling God, look at I, I surrender this property. It's too big for me. I will pray. I will write Congress people about you know things that I think ought to be improved upon. But mm -hmm. um, uh, I have to remember that. Um, 
We're made of body and soul. The body's temporary. The soul's eternal. I yeah. need to keep working on my soul, my spiritual life, and helping others do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And focus on what's important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly true. Now, yeah. Every day I uh, I start my day, I, I uh, so I recite the greatest commandment. I do it a little differently, though. Uh, the Lord, my God, is Lord alone. I love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and all my strength. That helps me get started in the right way. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. I have to personalize. Keep me in yeah. the picture. So God doesn't push me out, you know. So. <laughs> I isn't going to push you out. <laughs> He's probably saying, get back here. <laughs> yeah, get back to work. Your work's not done yet. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably true. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot when you think about it how many problems there are but slowly one by one hopefully things will change things will turn around you know it's yeah if we believe in god's power there's no way that i think that things can continue indefinitely on the current path you know i mean the current path isn't going to go up at all it's only going to go down more <laughs> so so that's uh you know, I trust that God won't let that happen. Yeah, I'm I'm following uh, Father Michael Schmitz on the uh, Bible in here right now, and uh, you know, over and over, Israel screws up royal. Mm-hmm. And God, you know, lets them screw up because he he's not reaching them, and then all at once, you know, somebody overcomes them, destroys them, and they're back leaning on God, and. Mm-hmm. God does some miraculous thing, just like, you know, going into the promised land and the walls of Jericho or so many other things that are like, yep. man could never have done those things. Um, right. Must be the walls of Jericho are about to fall again, you know. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure history is going to repeat itself somehow, hopefully. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hopefully we wake up. Yeah, that would be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We should pray for that. Wake up. Wake yeah. up America. And mm-hmm. most of the world, that's not just America. Uh, yep. uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think we're coming about to the end of our time. Um, it, is there anything that you want to emphasize or make some more points about? Um, I, I so uh, this sounds selfish, but it's not until it would be. Um, I I would encourage people to buy my book. Um, I think the stories in the book do the talking and are more effective reaching people in a lot of ways than I am talking to them directly. Um, I know for myself, <clears throat> um, my wife and I have a library, and we've read pretty much all of them, three to 4,000 books in there, but we could never give them away because we always highlight, underline, turn corners, because we take, when we read those books, our intention is to learn from them. And I, in this book, there's a, a section after each chapter uh, for notes and to write down what gold nugget did you take away from this story and what can you do with it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I encourage I encourage people to buy the book, use the book as a tool to help you develop a closer spiritual life with God, and to you know to to let Him touch your heart and make huge differences in your life. My goal was to never uh, talk about how to fix that specific problem. It was how to take the lesson. And so I would encourage. You know, I would encourage people to read it and to 
uh, hopefully gain from it uh, uh, something that would bless your life. And mm -hmm. and uh, so once we receive the blessing, that's only part of our job. The rest of it is for sure. So um, I, I would pray for people to do that as well. Share the stories, share the lessons, whatever. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, and I, I think finally, I think uh, the one of my primary goals in the book is for people to draw closer to God. And you can do that through prayer, through the sacraments, and certainly giving a reverence to God that he deserves because he loves you and I more than we can ever imagine. I for us. I mean, just an incredibly brutal death. Unbelievable death. So God loves us and wants us to come to him again. Not just today, but every day and into eternity. Uh, we are all worthy of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Very good. So I think that this uh this interview may have some impact on people. You know, a lot of times I, I, I interview, as I said, well over 300 people. And, you know, the, the books are all interesting and they have some religious content. But I think this one might actually have some impact. That's great. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> okay, would you like to close us in prayer? I would feel honored. Mm -hmm. Dear God in heaven, we are so grateful for this time together, for the work that WCAT has done, for Cynthia's dedication and love and helping others through these interviews. We thank you so much for the charisms that you built down into them that they share with us. We pray in this Easter season for a new resurrection of life, faith, and love for everyone who will listen to your word and make a difference in the world. We pray for your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much for the interview, and I, I hope you sell a lot of those books so that uh, so that we can kind of turn the culture around. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I really enjoyed this. So, thank you. I did too. It was really great. I, I pray for you in your in the next stage uh, from here on out for the the things that you engage in. And uh, I know whatever you do, you'll make a difference. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. Have a yep. good evening. You too. Bye bye. Yeah.